all right what is going on guys so today we're going to be installing bc racing coilovers on alex's e36 so i shouldn't even have to explain why you're going to install coilovers because coilovers are just coilovers and they're the best out there so right out of the gate we're going to be going full stance so like my m3 how it's completely dropped um alex's i think you're on stock suspension right yeah so we got 18 inch wheels on stock suspension and it looks whack and then we got stanced on 18s on the left and it just looks way better so Alex finally got some coilovers. So these are BC BRs, they're custom. So they're swift springs and extreme lows and we're gonna be dropping them at max tilt out of the gate. So we're gonna show you guys how to do that and just some other general tips and tricks when installing coilovers. So for the purpose of this video, we're only gonna be doing one side. So we're gonna be doing one rear and one front, but the application and how you apply it is the same on both sides. So there's really no point in doing the left side and the right side and show you guys how to do each every nut and bolt. So we're just gonna do one rear and one front. I'm gonna give you guys some tips for installing both sides. Kind of, when I do coilovers, I like to do them at the same time. So I'll do both rears at the same time and both fronts at the same time. I'll talk to you guys a little bit about that when we're in it as to why I do it that way. The sway bar will kind of mess you up, especially on the front, not so much in the back. First step is to get the car off the ground onto jack stands and get the wheels off. All right, so now we're gonna remove the lower shock. So there's an 18 millimeter bolt here. Note that I have a jack under the brake rotor. So the only thing holding this assembly up, I guess right now is the shock itself. So when we take this down, the trailing arm and all that stuff is gonna lower. What you don't wanna do is take this out without a jack there because it's gonna come flinging down and that's not good. We're gonna take this up. Now to get the spring out, we need to push this guy down a little bit more and grab the spring and pull it out at the same time. All right, so next up we need to get into here. So this is where the shock mounts. So we're gonna have to pull all of this fun stuff back to access the shock bolts. So I had to remove the cassette player or the CD player that was right here and then the speaker from the back. On the OBD2 cars like my 97 M3, you don't have to remove this much stuff to get this out. You literally just can pull it and pull it back. So once it's off, we have access to our shock mount, which is this guy right here. The factory bolts are 13s. The BC coilovers we're gonna be installing are 12s. All right, so now we're gonna be installing the rear coilover shock and adjusting the shock height. So the rears, the spring and the shock itself are not side dependent, so either one can go on either side. The fronts are dependent, so there is a left and a right for the fronts, but the rears don't matter. So we're gonna take our nuts off. I'm gonna snug them. All right, so these get torqued to 17 foot-pounds or 204 inch-pounds. Remember, with BCs, they are 12, not 13. If you use a 13, you're probably gonna strip it. And we're not gonna put any of this stuff back together because we're gonna adjust the damping when we go and drive the car. So we're just gonna leave it like this for now. So before we continue, we're gonna adjust the shock body height. Now, the reason you do this is if you're driving your car excessively hard or drifting or doing any kind of high performance driving, if you're just stance boy, this really doesn't matter. But what we're adjusting is the length of this body. So underneath here, you have your bump stop. And what you want is the bump stop to hit the top mount before your trailing arm hits the body. So we're gonna jack all this stuff up. You have to bolt this to the trailing arm, leave the spring out, otherwise you're gonna have a good time compressing it. But we're gonna raise this up, and if the trailing arm touches, or the control arm touches before the bump stop touches, then we're out of adjustment. We're gonna have to lengthen or shorten that. And you want maybe a quarter of an inch clearance because the bump stop will compress under super heavy load. So you want a little bit of space between the frame and the trailing arm and all the other stuff. And we're just gonna kind of watch the suspension, watch the axle, watch the lower control arm, watch everything kind of come up and compress. And you wanna make sure that nothing else is hitting and that the bump stop hits first. Keep going, keep going, keep going. So I'm gonna run the bolts in all the way. I'm not gonna tighten it down. We don't need it to be super tight. You just don't want it like in there like finger tight and hanging out. 
pretty much want this thing tight. You don't want it to be moving around. So now Alex is going to go up with the jack. Just keep going. And we want to make sure that nothing else touches and that the bump stop touches first. So we're at max compression with the shock. We still have a lot of room between the trailing arm and the frame. And we still have room between the control arm and the frame. So this is a little higher than it really needs to be. You can get away with a little bit more drop out of that. But I'm okay with this for now. Alex isn't really going to drive this thing that hard. On top of that, I don't think our wheel is going to tuck this high. As you can see, the spindle height is super high in the wheel well. So we're probably going to run into fitment issues and rubbing well before the suspension even travels this high. But this is just something good to do if you're going to be driving your car hard or drifting or just abusing it. You know, you could also put the wheel on here and raise it up like this and see what touches first. But as long as we don't have contact between the trailing arm and the control arm and the bump stop is doing its job, then we should be good. So I think if anything, Alex is going to start hitting his wheel and fender and rubbing before the suspension gets this compressed, but it's always good to just keep an eye on and check it. So I'm not going to worry about adjusting this down and making the clearance more. If you want more shock travel and you're running a smaller wheel and tire size or you're running over fenders and you're more worried about clearance like this and good suspension travel, this is a good thing to do. But I think for this application, we're good. So now we're going to take this bolt back out so we can install our spring. So now we're going to go ahead and install our spring. Now I've seen a lot of guys talk about putting the spring perch at the bottom. Um, if you're going to be running these, I always put them at the top. The main reason I install them up top is when you go to adjust it, you can actually access your things. If it's way down there, you're gonna, you don't have a straight shot at them, so you're going to be kind of going in weird and adjusting it weird. So it's just going to be a more pain in the ass if you put it on the bottom. So how you adjust these is this top one gets loosened and you thread that up and then you can thread this up or down to raise the ride height of the car. And then when you've got it where you want it, then you just tighten this one back down and then it locks it into place. So here we have the factory coilover perch. So if you spin that collar up and spin that collar up, that will shorten the distance between here and here, which lowers the car if you want to raise it. You spin it back down and then when you want to lock it in place, you spin this guy down. And this pretty much acts like a thread lock. So when you tighten these down into each other, it's pretty much going to lock the threads into place and that's not going to move. So if you're running them, same thing with the shock body. You always want to make sure it's tight. Even if you didn't adjust it, sometimes they can come loose out of the box. But in Alex's case, since we're going for max stance, we're going to be removing these all together. Also, um, this is an extreme low kit, so if you want to go full drop on a non-extreme low kit, like we did on the Cheeto or like we did on the bucket, this body is longer on a factory kit, like an out-of-the-box kit, like if you ordered a kit from Amazon. Um, this was a special order extreme low kit. So this is actually shorter. So with a stock one, it may be that tall, maybe a little bit taller. What'll happen is if you run these, these are the max drop perches we're gonna be putting on. So you pretty much just put these over the collar like that. And so what that does on the spring is it moves the perch to here. You have to ditch this perch if you're doing this by the way. And you can see that the collar sits inside of the spring. So it pretty much takes this whole shot, the spring travel from here to here, because this is gonna hit the body if it compresses too much. With a factory kit, it sits almost about there. And so what you wanna do is you wanna go in and cut the top off. So we did this on the bucket, and we did this on the Cheeto for those kits to run them this low. So this is a soft aluminum, so it cuts super easy. So we just took a Sawzall and we just cut it across. Um, we put two collars on so we could kind of use it as like a die. It's really not the right way to do it, but a thread cleaner. And we just backed it off and cleaned the threads off to make sure that it's still threaded in case we run a run um, collars like this again. So 
With an extreme low kit, don't worry about it. Just put it together like this and throw it in the car. If you have an off the shelf kit, you're gonna have to trim that. Otherwise that's gonna hit the body of your car if you're sitting that low. So now we're gonna go ahead and install our spring like that. And one thing we're gonna have to note is we're gonna have to be kind of cautious and kind of guide this in as we jack the trailing arm up into place. So again, we're jacking it up by the front kind of hub on the rotor. So Alex's job is gonna be running the jack and keeping sure the spring is aligned in its little groove. And I'm gonna be doing this guy. This guy gets 57 foot-pounds. Which is not a lot, it's about half what lugs get torqued to, about a little over half, but yeah. All right, so rinse and repeat for the other side and then on to the front. Ooh. Oh, <laughs> All right, so now we're moving on to the front. A couple things to note before we get started here. One is kind of do both at the same time. You don't really have to, but at minimum disconnect the sway bar from both fronts at the same time before you start working. If you're not gonna mess with the sway bar, then make sure you jack both sides up when we get to that step at the same time. So what'll happen is the sway bar will get kind of bound up and it'll be a real pain in the ass to do the other side. So I have a little Lego thing that I made. So this is pretty much a sway bar, kind of. So you have your main bar here and you have your links coming up. So this is where your end links will attach to. So if you can visualize that. So a sway bar is a torsion bar. So the sway bar actually will twist like this. That's how sway bars work. So when you see the spindle height is kind of level with the bottom of the fender right now, with the coilover, the spindle height is about here. It sits literally in the, men in the center of the wheel well. So what will happen is if you do one side and attach the sway bar, or keep the sway bar attached, is you're gonna pitch this side up. So your sway bar on the side with the coilover is gonna be up and then the stock sway bar on the other side with the stock shock is gonna be down. So what that's doing is it's keeping this side of the sway bar in constant upward tension and it's gonna be a pain to get it off on the other side when you go to do the other side. So disconnect the sway bar from both sides or when you go to jack it up to bolt the spindle to the coilover, do both sides at the same time because the sway bar is gonna to wanna to follow itself if that makes sense. So another thing I wanna mention real quick is the sway bar and the mounting. So the BC coilovers do have a different sway bar tab on them because they are M3 coilovers. So the bracket is actually right here on the shock itself and that is the way it is for M3s. So the non-M cars mount their sway bar to the control arm down here. The M3s do have a different size sway bar. So if you have a non-M car, I would honestly leave the sway bar alone because putting the M3 link on will change the characteristics of the sway bar. It'll change the tension even though the bar is the same size because it's on a different mounting point. I'm not exactly sure how it will change the spring rate of the sway bar itself. So I have no idea how it's gonna change the suspension geometry with a non-M bar linking it to an M3 style. So for this car, we're gonna leave the sway bar alone until we go to upgrade the sway bar to either an M bar or a performance M bar. At which point, then we'll move the sway bar link to where it should be on an M car, which is on the shock mount itself. But for this purpose, we're gonna be leaving the sway bar alone. So there's a little nut on the back and you can fit a wrench on there to get that off and then take all that stuff off and then put the link in on there and then onto the shock. But that's probably gonna be the last thing you're gonna do Again, you're gonna run into that torsion issue if you have one side up and the other side down. So this is on our drift car. So 318 chassis. So stock sway bar links, not touching the coil at all. And this is on my M3. So this is an M3 sway bar. You can sway, see the sway bar link go up to the shock. I'll give you guys a better shot of where that mount sits when we're doing the install. So the first step is we're gonna to want to get everything that's attached to the strut itself off. Our padware sensor, I believe. We have the wheel speed sensor back here. So those do have little rubber mounts that clip into the bracket on the strut and then the brake line. Lock that guy out. Just like that. 
So you want to get everything off so that way you're not pulling on any of the lines or the cords or the wires. All right, so now we have three 18 millimeter bolts that we need to get to. So one right here, and this guy has a nut. The nut's actually on this side. So there's a bolt going this way through. And then we have two bolts back here, which are in here on both sides that need to come out. So here's one of two of our side mounting bolts. So here's bolt number two, it's that guy right there. So that is your lower brake caliper bolt and this is the back of the caliper itself. And number three, you put a wrench on the back. So once that's off, we can start going after the 13s up top. So the thing to note here is that the spindle, the brake, and all that stuff is going to have nothing holding it up except for the tie rod ball joint and the control arm ball joint. So this thing is going to want to move all over the place as soon as we take this off. So I always put a jack underneath to kind of hold it in place just to make sure it doesn't go anywhere. All right, so next up we're going to be going after the 313s up top here. So sometimes there'll be a plastic cover covering these nuts. You can just pop that off. And then be careful when you're taking the last one off because this thing is going to start to sink down. That was from the original. But this one's not because we have the jack under there. So now I'm going to start to lower the jack down. Pull our bolts out. So that's going to come forward and then our strut can come out. So you can see that this is just hanging out wobbling, so you don't want to be pulling on any of these brake lines. Put the weight back. It's kind of a balancing act to get it to sit nicely. So there we go. We have no tension on the brake line, so we're good. All right, so we're going to go put the new coilover in. So unlike the rears, the fronts do have an orientation. So this is the front left. So FL, front left. The other one will say FR on it, it means for front right. And that just has to do with the orientation of this. And this is the sway bar tab for the M3 um, that the other factory strut did not have. So like the other, we're gonna take the nuts off of the top. Now one thing that I like to do when installing front suspension is keep everything loose and tighten it all kind of down at the same time. Less so on the rears because it's a very simple setup, but this is pretty involved. So you have this holding the front spindle up and you have all this stuff holding the spindle up as well. So if you can get movement in the spindle and in these hardware and in this hardware up top, it's just gonna be a lot easier to get everything to line up. So when you put the shock mounts up top, if you put them on tight and torque them to spec without all of this stuff in, it's gonna be harder to get this stuff to bolt in. So kind of leave these loose. I mean, you can leave them in you know kind of that deep but you do want to have some like rotational play once the strut is in there it's going to make it a lot easier to get everything to line up properly because the bottom bolts mainly are the ones that are kind of more annoying and again you want to have all of the cords and the wires and the brake line on this side on the back side of the coilover So another quick tip, something that I forgot. So this is a camber plate, not a caster plate. It should be sitting like this. This, the way we have it right now, is incorrect. So just make a note of that, mental note. And the top hat does rotate independently of the coil. So it'll help you get it lined up. Okay, so we're on. Our camera plate is oriented correctly, and these still have some looseness to them. This one has the weight of it, so it won't spin very easily. But we can take this whole strut and move it back and forth a little bit side to side. That's gonna help us orient it and get it bolted to this a lot easier. All right, to prevent the sway bar binding, I have taken the nut off 
of the sway bar link on both sides. So this is gonna allow the sway bar to adjust itself and not bind up the other side. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and bolt the strut down to the spindle. We're gonna need to jack this up quite a bit. Uh, for those of you guys who are looking for way more camber, these washers come with the BC Coilover kit. This is for you hot boys who are trying to camber the crap out of your cars and the camber plates aren't enough. What you do is you put these washers between, you put them right here, between the spindle down here and this. What that'll do is space out the spindle kind of like that, giving you more camber. So it'll pivot off of that top bolt and tilt the spindle back to give you more camber. Put our nut on. Now the struggle of getting these lower bolts on begins. And we got two, baby. Oh yeah. And like the rear, the front gets 204 inch pounds. And then all three of our 18 millimeters get 78 foot pounds. Lastly, we need to reconnect all of our lines into their new little bracket up here. All right, so that's what it looks like when it's all back in. It's kind of hard to do with one hand holding a camera. So note that the sway bar is back onto the control arm. I still have it unbolted. So back onto the sway bar binding issue. So that's our spindle height. So the top of the brake rotor is pretty much in line with the bottom of the indicator. Here we have the side with a factory suspension. So you can see it's pretty much dead center with the skirt. And our sway bar is sitting way above the control arm. So if I had left this bolted in, this part of the link would still be bolted down there. And this whole sway bar, like that Lego piece, would be twisted under tension, pushing this up. So when I go to take this stuff off, this control arm and this spindle assembly is gonna to wanna to come up all the time, which makes it a pain to get it off. So with the coilover completely installed, this is where your M3 sway bar tab is. So the link is gonna come through the back here and then drop down to the sway bar itself. So now that we've got the passenger side done, we're gonna go ahead and reattach the sway bar, put the wheels on and start going for ride height adjustments. Alright, so now that we've got the coilovers installed, we are going to be adjusting the ride height in the front. With the right wheel offset, the wheels will tuck in the back like they are on this. I've never had an issue running that low with rubbing. So with the right wheel offset, kind of setting your rear ride height is more of a personal preference than a functional necessity. With the wrong wheel offset and if you're rubbing, you're going to want to roll your fenders, throw some camber at it if you want to stay that low, which is really not preferred because you should be getting a proper alignment done uh, when you install coilovers. If not, you can just raise it until you have enough suspension clearance and travel to drive the car properly. So while the front drop on this does look good, it is way too low to be a functional driving car. He just rubs even just trying to move this thing to park it. We're going to need to raise the front to make it an actual drivable car. So that's what we're going to be doing today. Yeah, let's get started. So how you adjust these is this top one gets loosened and you thread that up and then you can thread this up or down to raise the ride height of the car. And then when you've got it where you want it, then you just tighten this one back down and then it locks it into place. 
So here we have the factory coilover perch. So if you spin that collar up and spin that collar up, that will shorten the distance between here and here, which lowers the car if you want to raise it. You spin it back down. And then when you want to lock it in place, you spin this guy down. And this pretty much acts like a thread lock. So when you tighten these down into each other, it's pretty much going to lock the threads into place and that's not going to move. So if you're running them, same thing with the shock body. You always want to make sure it's tight, even if you didn't adjust it. Sometimes they can come loose out of the box. All right, so on to raising. So this is your collar for raising and lowering coilovers. This is not your collar for raising and lowering. This is for setting the spring preload. This is set from the factory by BC or probably whatever manufacturer you're using. Do not mess with this unless you know what you're doing. This is how we're gonna be raising and lowering it. So you wanna loosen this collar and spin the whole shock body in the shock mount housing. And that is going to shorten and lengthen the size of the coilover itself. The height that you raise it or lower it does not equate to the height of the wheel and the fender. So if you raise this one inch, you are not get one inch gap between the wheel and the tire and that's something you need to remember. So we're going to raise this probably 0.75 inches to start and it is not going to give us a 0.75 inch raise on the wheel and tire itself. So you might need to be adjusting it higher than you think you would to get the result you want from outside the car. At and so we're at about 11 and a quarter. go pretty much up to one foot. It's going to give us 0.75. So now I'm going to spin the whole coil over. And as I'm doing this, this is getting pushed down. And we're just going to go until we go to one foot. And this is really dependent on your setup. Each car is going to be a little bit different. So if you set your height to the same length as the one we are on this car, you might not get the same stance, style, and result in wheel fitment. Um, the wheels also, the wheel and tire size, do play a big part in that setup. So, there we go. So we got a little more to go. So that's about one foot right there. collar back down and we're going to tighten it and this is the smaller of the two wrenches pull over spanners so now we're going to put the wheel back on and check our fitment another thing is that the suspension is going to settle a little bit after a couple couple of drives so what you set up right now might not be your final you might have to adjust it a little bit more towards the end All right, so we got it set to about where we wanted to, so we raised it 0.75 on both sides. Um, so we're gonna go lock to lock. One thing to note is in the last little bit, the car will raise up. So we have more clearance here than we do when it's straight. Go the other way. Other way. Yeah, we should be all right. So we're gonna drive it, make sure that it doesn't rub, and if it does rub a little bit, then we are going to raise it up a little bit more. All right, so now we're gonna talk about adjusting the damping of the coilovers. And first of all, it is damping, not dampening. I would like to make that very clear just so you guys can get your terminology correct. Dampening makes slightly wet. 
damping, a decrease in the amplitude of an oscillation as a result of energy being drained from the system to overcome frictional or other resistive forces. So adjusting the damping is adjusting the compression and the rebound stiffness of the shock. And that is done with a little knob on top of the coilover. So you go left to go softer and right to go harder if I remember correctly. And you need to adjust them in pairs. So front is a pair, rear is a pair. Do not adjust the front left four clicks and the front right eight clicks because that is gonna do very weird shit in terms of handling balance. BCs, it is compression and rebound in the same turn. So if you turn one click, you're adjusting the compression and the rebound. Some fancier coilovers have compression and rebound on separate adjustments, but BCs, they're both integrated into one. So setting it is more of a personal preference thing, but there are some factors that can influence how you adjust it. And it depends on what you're doing with the car. So with a full weight car like mine for daily driving, I have it about six away from the hardest in the rear and about eight from the hardest in the front. I would recommend starting harder and going softer as opposed to starting soft and going harder. Um, the reason is if you set it too soft to start, you could be scraping your chassis and hitting your bump stops and bottoming out versus starting hard where it's just uncomfortable versus starting soft where you're like scraping the chassis and bouncing it, you know, not good stuff for the suspension. So if you're doing a track car, obviously you're gonna wanna set it a little stiffer. We're running BC coilovers on pretty much every single car we have at my house, including the drift car. So that car is gutted. So it's much lighter than a factory car. And we have it set about four away, all the way around from stiffest. Um, the main reason is we want stiffer suspension on that. The roads we drive on, like Adams, are very, very smooth compared to normal roads. And so we can get away with having a stiffer suspension setup without it being completely jarring. That car is brutal to drive on the street because it is gutted and because it is so stiff. One of the things that make it more stiff is having much stiffer suspension with a gutted chassis. So, but for daily driving on this sedan, I have it set six away from hardest on the rear and eight away from hardest in the front. It rides more like a firm street car, more like a firm factory car than anything else. Um, we are running it a little bit stiffer because the car is low. I'm sure if you had it not tucking in the rear, you could get away with running it a little bit softer in the rear. Kind of start wherever you want. If you want to start from mine, so eight in front, six in rear and start there and adjust. That might give you a good starting point for getting these things dialed in. And then it's just all personal preference. So if it's a street car and you're driving it and you set it to wherever you set it and you go, oh, it's way too stiff in the rear or it's not stiff enough in the front, make your adjustments and just find where you want to drive them. Find where it drives nice and smooth. And if you're going to the track, you can stiffen it up a little bit. You know, if you're at the track and you're struggling with grip, you can change how the car behaves and how the car grips. So if you want more traction in the rear, you can soften it a little bit or you can stiffen the front. If you need more front grip, you can stiffen the rear and soften the front. And it just all kind of comes down to personal preference for street cars. Find what's best, especially if you're at the track. Um, tire pressures is gonna come into play pretty well there as far as grip bias goes. And the truth is you just gotta kind of play with the setup and figure out what you like and what works for you. All right guys, good luck with your coilover install and setup. If you have any questions, let me know down in the comment section below. Thank you guys so much for watching. Keep it fresh and I will see you guys later. Search but you stay lost We are